Key Afghan cities are falling to the radical Islamic Taliban with unprecedented speed. With international troops largely gone, the militants are escalating their offensive, capturing wide swathes of countryside and nine provincial capitals, including Kunduz, once a center of resistance to the Taliban and the site of the German Bundeswehr base. Hundreds of thousands of civilians are fleeing. Conditions are desperate for many of those who've been displaced. Our question today, Taliban advance, is Afghanistan lost? Welcome to To The Point. Joining us in the studio, Sandra Petisman, Afghanistan expert with Deutsche Welle's investigative unit. And she says Germany needs to conduct a ruthless and independent review of its most expensive and bloodiest foreign mission to date. Also a pleasure to welcome Thomas Rutte. He is co-director of the independent think tank Afghanistan Analyst Network. And he says the West quite simply got it wrong and must bear the bulk of the blame for the current crisis in Afghanistan. And joining us from Bonn is Ahmed Wali Ashkakasai. He is from DW's Dari and Pashto desk. And he argues that the overhasty invasion of Afghanistan was a mistake. The planless exit is a catastrophe. So let us start with a look at what's happening right now in the country. And Wally, if I may uh, begin with you, you say that the planless exit is a catastrophe. What are you hearing from friends and relatives in Afghanistan about the situation at the moment? Uh, we are able to see the current situation um, uh, in social media live. We see how uh, people are living in Kandahar, in Helmand, and in other provinces where the war is going on, uh, where uh, people have no shelter, where internal displaced people um, are searching for refuge, where uh, women, children, um, uh, and old men do not know what will happen tomorrow. Uh, um, a kind of perspectiveless uh, uh, perspectivelessness is uh, overwhelming all uh, or the most the people that we talk to. So uh, it is very tough for all Afghans at the moment, especially for those uh, who live uh, in the war areas and uh, war is everywhere. Well, what are people expecting? Uh, some analysts are saying that if the Taliban could so easily take these areas in the north, which are actually non-Pashtun areas where they're used to be considerable resistance uh, to the Taliban, that the, they will undoubtedly overrun the capital of Kabul within months. Would you agree with that? Uh, we have the latest uh, uh, analysis of the um, U.S. military, and uh, they think that it is possible that even uh, uh, in few weeks the Taliban may uh, overrun Kabul. And the Afghan government is deeply divided internally uh, and also seems to be completely overwhelmed, especially now that the necessary air support from foreign troops as uh, well as the necessary logistical help is no longer there uh, or really limited. Uh, uh, this is why the uh, U.S. military uh, thinks also that uh, um, Taliban may take uh, Kabul very soon, and uh, it really may be the case. Sandra, uh, as you say, this was Germany's uh, longest foreign mission to date. How do people in Afghanistan now see the Western troops and the Western countries who fought so long and are now so hastily beating a retreat? Let me tell you what my friends are telling me who are still on the ground, who are fearing for their future, for their lives occasionally, depending on where in the country they are. There is a sense of betrayal. There is a sense of you leave us alone with this mess that you created. Um, perspectivelessness is something that Wiley has already mentioned. Where do we go from here? So the sense of betrayal is real and I can understand that because the situation that we see in Afghanistan on the ground right now, civil war being developing in the country on a daily basis, reaching ever closer to the capital Kabul, that is something that the Afghans 
have not created. That comes from elsewhere. And we have to look back at all the mistakes that were made very early on when this international intervention started on 7th of October 2001, when the first US bombs were dropped in Afghanistan. We're going to take a closer look at that in just a moment. Uh, US President Joe Biden made it clear this week that the US won't be putting any more boots on the ground. Let's hear what he had to say. They've got to fight for themselves, fight for their nation. The United States, I'll insist we continue to keep the commitments we made of providing close air support, making sure that their Air Force functions and is operable, res resupplying their forces with food and equipment, and paying all their salaries. They've got to want to fight. President Biden clearly implying there that the pretty well-equipped government forces could be fighting harder. Would you absolve, you, you said in your opening statement that the West must bear the bulk of the blame, but would you absolve the government uh, and the army, uh, the Afghan army of responsibility for this mess? Yeah, I mean, the statement from my point of view puts things a little bit upside down. I mean, it were the U.S. with their separate agreement with the Taliban who pulled the carpet from under the feet of the Afghan government and the Afghan forces and uh, are largely responsible for the drop in morale. But that started much earlier, of course, because um, uh, first the combat mission went wrong, the Taliban became stronger, not weaker. Um, and then there was that, what I see as a fig leaf mission, a resolute support, training, equipping, the Afghan army and saying, OK, you're now responsible alone after US and other troops were not uh, able to defeat the Taliban uh, before. So I think that's a little bit uh, putting the blame into, uh, uh, onto the weaker party. That backup support that Biden mentioned, uh, air cover and, and so on, how much of a different w difference will that make? I'm afraid it wouldn't make too much of a difference. You can uh, stop the Taliban here and there probably for a while. If you have an intensive bombing campaign, you probably uh, can even force them to sit down and start talking again, which would be uh, positive. But we also need to say that uh, at the receiving end, it's not only Taliban. Uh, there's fighting ongoing in urban centers. There's a lot of civilians and they're harmed by the fire and the bombs and the shelling of uh, both sides. And if you are, are at the receiving end as an Afghan, uh, in the end, it doesn't make a difference for you whether it's an American bomb or a Taliban shell. At any rate, U.S. President Joe Biden has clearly made it his mission to bring closure on a foreign war that began, as we heard, nearly 20 years ago. After the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center, the United States and its allies invaded Afghanistan. Their common goal was to eliminate the Al-Qaeda terrorist organization and its leader, Osama bin Laden. The country occupied by the Islamist Taliban was no longer to be a haven for terrorists from around the world. But the construction of a stable civil society and democracy was not successful. Corruption and drug trafficking continue to flourish, whilst most of the population lives in abject poverty. And the Taliban could not be defeated either. In return, some 3,500 servicemen and women of NATO and its allies have died in Afghanistan so far. The 2020 Doha deal between the US and the Taliban also failed to bring about peace. The mission's lack of prospects and escalating costs nevertheless persuaded the United States to withdraw. The departure of the Allied troops also marks the end of the costliest mission in the history of the German armed forces. So was it all for nothing? And let me put that question straight away to Wally. Wally, the fact is the Western forces did manage to kill Osama bin Laden. They did decimate al-Qaeda. They did uh, reduce the Taliban's influence sufficiently for elections to be held and for some Afghan girls to go to school. Was it nonetheless all a mistake? There were many mistakes made. Um, talks with Taliban should have been uh, should have uh, taken place as early as 2001, and one should not only have relied on the military map. Um, that's what we hear, unfortunately, now as well. That Biden is 
talking about war. There is no military solution uh, for this conflict. Uh, and recognizing former armed groups and militias, providing them with money, facilities, and weapons, and making them partners was uh, a very, very big mistake uh, if one was hoping to pacify uh, the country through disarmament and democratization. As a result, what we have in Afghanistan right now is a kind of pseudo-democracy. Uh, in addition, the regional players uh, which should have helped um, uh, forge a solution were not involved in the way that they should have been. And the things that we call, um, uh, uh, which has achieved in 20 years, they are really very fragile. And without peace, all those things will uh, be uh, vanished very soon. Sandra, how do you see it? I would completely agree with Wally. I mean, um, what we've seen the past 20 years is really that military, the military footprint always triumphed over diplomacy, politics, developmental aid. And you can't solve a conflict like the one in Afghanistan, which was already 20 years old before the intervention even started, with just throwing troops and money at the situation and thinking that with airstrikes, night raids, drone attacks, you will solve the problem and you will, you know, bring democracy to Afghanistan. That's way too easy. There wasn't a clear blueprint of how to go about it and that always the military was in a driving seat right from the start. Um, entering bad alliances with warlords because you had the same enemy. That was something that led in Afghanistan to a very weak and hollow and corrupt state um, which could not carry democracy. And we see the effects of that now unfolding because the civil war is back in full swing. Uh, Thomas, the Afghan government uh, and Taliban leaders are still officially conducting negotiations uh, and uh, still talking about a peace process. The Biden administration clearly hopes that that can still yield some form of negotiated power sharing agreement. Is that completely illusory, would you say? I wouldn't say completely illusory, but uh, the approach uh, in the beginning, which excluded the Afghan government, um, was a big mistake. I mean, the talks, if we look at it, uh, are not conducted between the Taliban and the Afghan government, but about uh, uh, with a delegation from Kabul, which represents not only the government, but uh, other political factions, because the Taliban do not recognize the Afghan government and don't want to talk with them uh, directly. I mean, it would be high time now to put uh, pressure uh, uh, on both sides, actually, to start talking there. From, uh, up to now, that has only been uh, uh, very, very little uh, progress. I mean, they even uh, didn't manage to finalize an agenda. So, um, yeah, uh, those negotiations started wrong, but uh, the only hope actually is to put them on the right footing. And, and probably there's a chance in the Taliban advances that they come to a point that's a hope, uh, not a prediction, that they say, okay, we are so strong now, we can sit down uh, and talk. But they will, of course, dictate their uh, conditions and it will not be up uh, to the Afghan government, unfortunately. Sandra, Taliban leaders say that they do favor a political settlement. Uh, Afghan President uh, Ashraf Ghani says uh, he sees no evidence whatsoever of that. Do you see any? I mean, obviously, I'm here in Berlin watching from afar, but I, I see a clear disconnect between the messaging that comes from the Doha office, which is essentially the political office um, of the Taliban, and what is happening on the ground with the commanders um, commandeering this lightning offensives, multiple lightning offensives that we see, because it's in so many different parts of the country, and we see so many various pictures. You have districts where Girls' schools, for instance, remain open and others where they are closed immediately. You have areas where music is still allowed and others where it was one of the first things that got banned. And of course you hear the messaging of peace and of like more moderate voices coming from Doha, but what we see on the ground is a military, militant movement edging ever closer to the capital Kabul and whether we will see urban combat there or you know, something like strangulating whoever is in there, cutting them off from supply lines. That is something that I could envisage. And we can only hope, as Thomas Rotich has said, that at some point, either through pressure or because the momentum is so high that we can now sit down and talk, it will lead to negotiations back in Doha because the civilian population is in the crossfire everywhere. 
Well, um, let me get your take also on that question about the prospects uh, for any uh, real uh, offici uh, uh, negotiated settlement. But I'd also like to ask you about the influence of geopolitics, because we're seeing China, Russia, Iran receiving Taliban leaders for talks, India acknowledging that they've also had a back channel uh, to the Taliban. So what would you say would be the consequences of that in terms of the balance of power, both within Afghanistan and uh, in the region as a whole? Well, um, the Taliban, they are, uh, they think that they are on the road uh, to victory. They think that they will very soon uh, take over Kabul. In this situation, I don't think that they might see the need uh, to uh, talk. Uh, uh, they want, even if they want uh, to talk, they uh, think that they will have more uh, to dictate uh, when they have more areas. And the regional um, uh, story is also one of the very s s sorry ones, because in the last 20 years, um, NATO and its allies, um, they were most of the time alone with all their initiatives. Uh, there were uh, no regional uh, powers uh, involved. They did not involve them. And now the key uh, solution may uh, lie uh, uh, again, so that uh, the regional uh, 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 for the regional uh, uh, countries that they are uh, uh, in uh, the negotiations, so that they can uh, stop their proxy wars uh, in Afghanistan. Afghan people they don't produce bullets, they don't produce weapons. Um, most Afghans uh, that we talk to, they ask themselves where all these weapons come from. So all these things come from outside. In Afghanistan, most uh, Afghans think that all the time there are proxy wars and proxy war going on. So they would have to find the solution, the international community, also outside Afghanistan, inside Afghanistan and in the region. Thomas, uh, at the moment, one has the impression that neither in Germany uh, nor in the U.S. Uh, do citizens really want to think very much about Afghanistan. They simply want it to go away. If Kabul falls, if we see China getting more involved in some way with a Taliban-led Afghanistan, do you think that opinions will change in Washington and or Berlin? Or is this washing of the hands uh, something that's likely to continue? One of the lessons we should have learned uh, over the 40 years of conflict in Afghanistan is that it's not up to us to set the agenda. Afghanistan sets, puts itself on the agenda very often, and that's happening in the moment, I have the feeling. I'm also not sure that the public is not interested uh, in Afghanistan. It's mainly politicians who have uh, relegated Afghanistan from uh, foreign, uh, foreign policy uh, priority to, I don't know, far beyond or far uh, uh, under uh, or behind Ukraine and uh, uh, other issues, climate crisis, which is not unimportant. Um, so uh, I think Afghanistan, with the Taliban uh, march towards power, has put itself on the agenda again, and uh, we need to react. I mean, this uh, decent interval, what the US government has hoped, uh, that was a, a term from after the Vietnam War, has not happened. It's collapsing now while the last US soldiers uh, are still there. And that shows that they bear a large part of the re responsibility. But of course, we should not only talk about the West, also the Afghan elites have an enormous portion of uh, uh, responsibility for what was happened by just uh, looking at their own interests, enriching themselves, allowing a corrupt system to grow. But we also, with open eyes, uh, watch that we as, as the West, and uh, while talking about fighting against corruption and drug uh, uh, trade, uh, we actually allowed our allies to be involved in that. Sandra, as the Taliban retakes power in provincial capitals and possibly ultimately in Kabul, would you expect it to revert to its old ways? Will we see a new reign of terror? Occasionally you hear voices, including from Washington, saying, surely the Taliban cannot have an interest uh, and, and all of these young girls who went to school, uh, surely it doesn't want to be seen to be thwarting their, uh, their needs. How do you see it? I think it's a little bit of crystal ball reading. I find it very hard to answer that now. What we see 
again, the, messages, the messaging in Doha in the political office is different from what we see on the ground, but there are undoubtedly radical forces, militant Islamist forces within the Taliban who really want nothing else but to bring back their fundamentalist Islamic emirate, which would leave very, very little space for women, for girls, for education, for a public life, for personal freedoms, for personal choices. And that is one possibility, but it is not the only possibility. I think it really depends on can the international community, and you've mentioned all the various forces active there, three atomic powers, the United States, Europe, can they come together in one diplomatic push and exert pressure to such an extent that the Taliban might might opt for a political solution, power sharing in Afghanistan. I mean, the decision-making body in the Taliban is the leadership council, which sits in large parts in, in Pakistan. Yes. Really don't know what they think. Uh, the Doha office is their foreign office. Uh, the military commanders are the defense ministry, so to say. The decision is taken above, and that's important. We should not uh, construct uh, um, this uh, uh, differences between those who are the foreign policy makers in the Taliban and those who are fighting on the ground. The important thing is to get the leadership to put a break on those people and those commanders on the ground who talk about revenge and killing. We will kill all these people who have worked with the West and so on, which is uh, giving uh, jitters to the people in Afghanistan. Exactly, and that is precisely the reason why we are seeing thousands flee as the international troops depart and the Taliban advances. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees, in fact, is warning of a looming humanitarian crisis. Fleeing ongoing fighting and the Taliban, these Afghans have found refuge in a school. There have been nearly three million internally displaced since the military operation began in Afghanistan. More and more people are also making the dangerous journey to neighboring countries and Europe. Turkey, the main country of transit, is where most of them get stranded. Many in Germany and Europe now fear a new wave of refugees and politicians intend to take this into consideration. As Germany's election campaign begins, the debate about Afghans living in the country is intensifying. Unlike many other EU countries, the German government has long insisted on deporting criminal Afghan asylum seekers. But it too has suspended deportation flights. Former Afghan helpers of the German armed forces feel particularly threatened by the advance of the Taliban and are hoping for asylum in Germany. But very few are really allowed to enter. Is Germany abandoning the people of Afghanistan? And Wally, let me put that question straight to you. As we heard, Germany has now suspended these deportation flights, but it certainly hasn't opened its doors wide to the Afghans, either who helped the Bundeswehr or those who helped German development agencies. So what would you say? Has Germany abandoned the Afghan people? Uh, Germans had a very good uh, um, image in, Germ uh, in Afghanistan. People in Afghanistan, they really trust Germans. But that might have changed now in the last 20 years because um, uh, the Afghans, it was not very really clear from the beginning uh, if the Germans were there uh, for uh, reconstruction or were they there for uh, war. And the decision, uh, I can only say it is a very good decision that no departures uh, uh, to Afghanistan, but it may... Uh, it would be better that uh, this decision uh, would have come uh, earlier. You know, in Germany, in Europe, we don't have death penalties anymore, but uh, deporting people, if they are criminals or not, um, uh, uh, removing them from here and depart, uh, deporting them to Afghanistan may end uh, as a, a death penalty. And I think that's something no one wants. Sandra, what do you think the West owes to all of those in Afghanistan who believed the dream that we essentially sold them over these years, a dream of democracy and human rights? Honesty. Honesty in the sense of let's really look at our mistakes made and further engagement, keep humanitarian channels open, invest in development aid. We need to get access to people. We need to help 
on the ground as much as we can and we need to decentralize this. So bring back humanitarian aid, give it to the organizations, let them reach out to the people and try to get diplomacy back on the floor. Meanwhile, Thomas, migration, the prospect of immigration also from Afghanistan remains an absolute political hot potato here in Germany and also, of course, in the U.S. The UNHCR, as I said, is now warning of a looming humanitarian crisis. Most of those who have been displaced so far are in neighboring countries. Could that change? Will we see a major ma wave of migration toward e Europe? I don't see that because uh, Europe has been very restrictive and most Afghans don't make it to Europe anymore. But those people on the run, either in the country or outside in the country, in the region, are those who we have a responsibility for because they flee now this chaos uh, in Afghanistan, the return of the Taliban, and for which we also have a large part of responsibility. So we have the responsibility to pr protect them, not only the local employees of Bundeswehr and the civilian ministries. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us uh, here today. And thank you very much to our audience for joining us. See you soon.